Internet so-called auditors or citizen journalists filming everywhere from the high streets to police stations and even pointing cameras into office building windows to film those inside have been heavily criticised for deliberately provoking reactions from police and security guards for the sole purpose of capturing it on film for views, clicks, likes and, of course, YouTube revenue. But the paradox here is that that wouldn't happen unless people watched it. So there is obviously some kind of interest in watching somebody going about provoking these reactions to generate views. But many of you have asked the question, and I mean seriously, lots of you ask these questions all the time, whether or not there is an expectation of privacy, whether data protection applies here, whether they are in breach of data protection, and even whether they might be guilty of harassment and even stalking. Stalking is just harassment that amounts to stalking. I'll come back to that a bit later. And you'll have to watch the end of the video because that's a little bit later in the video. But also, some people boldly declaring in the comment section that GDPR applies to businesses and organisations, not individuals. As long as the personal data is not provided, then I don't see a problem. Again, someone else says GDPR UK does not apply to individuals. So no, in answer to what was asked in the previous question. I just realised that's zoomed out. You can see it there. However, some people do see the truth behind this, which I'm going to come to in this video, and say, um, I'm disheartened by this information with regards to auditors. I've seen some shocking behaviour from auditors, and they can get away with it simply by saying I'm a journalist, and it's in the public interest. It's not quite that simple, which again, I'll come back to. I'm good at coming back to things, normally, anyway. Um, some people do actually see the truth and say GDPR does apply to individuals. If you possess, uh, process or collect uh, the data of EU residents, you're required to comply with GDPR, regardless whether you're a business, organisation or individual. So that is actually the truth. Data protection legislation, i.e. the Data Protection Act 2018 and the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulations, UK retained version thereof since Brexit. Thanks very much for that do apply to everybody, unless there's an exemption. The most common exemption for individuals that leads most people to believe that this doesn't apply to individuals is the household exemption. That being, if you're filming something purely for household purposes, then GDPR mostly doesn't apply. Now, it's where it comes outside of being wholly household activities that can land you within the scope of data protection legislation, including GDPR, because that does apply if you are doing so. Following on from my previous video, talking about static CCTV at your home, that is a fixed surveillance device of sorts. And if it's capturing individuals that are uniquely identifiable walking past your house, and it's a static camera, then you do need to comply with the data protection legislation. See my previous video for that one. Here, we're going to expand this out to talk about these auditors out and about in public and filming and contrast that with those I spoke of, the cyclists uh, filming motorists on their phone in the previous video as well, because there is a subtle difference between the two. Now, first of all, if you didn't know or you're struggling to accept that UK GDPR can apply to individuals, you'll probably just have to trust me until you've watched the whole of this video and perhaps several of my others. But let's go right back to the beginning and look at where GDPR applies in the first place, which starts with personal data. So what is personal data? Because that's what it's there to protect. Personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, known as a data subject. And an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier such as a name, an identification number, location data, an online identifier, or to one or more factors specific to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, social identity of that natural person. So it's very broad. It's any data or information that relates to somebody who can be personally identified. And that includes, for example, vehicle registration numbers because they will be registered to an individual, um, driving license numbers because they relate to an individual, phone numbers because they relate to an individual, and of course, the person's face because that relates to the individual. So UK GDPR applies to the processing of this personal data. What is processing? Well, processing is pretty much anything that you can do with that data. 
collecting it, recording it, storing it, transferring it, selling it, whatever you're doing with it, if you're doing something with that data, you are likely to be processing it. And if you are processing it, you are a data controller and you are subject to the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018. That goes for individuals and sole traders and small businesses and medium businesses, large businesses, public bodies, etc. So from the individual to the largest worldwide companies that process data in this way, they are subject to the same rules. It's not a different set of rules. It is the same set of rules. And on the subject of data protection and GDPR, it is crucially important that you protect the security of your identity and personal information when you browse the internet, which is why I partner with NordVPN for this channel. I've used NordVPN myself for many years, paying for it with my own money. I use it on my phone and on my laptop, whether I'm at home or traveling the country, because I travel a lot and I use cafe Wi-Fi networks. And I think it is absolutely crucial to have a layer of security and protection between you and the internet because there are suspicious websites out there there are malicious files and there are bad actors who are trying to get in between you and the genuine website for example the bank to steal information so that they can hack your accounts and your emails and things of this nature which can have a devastating effect on the rest of your life a few years ago i had a very strange experience myself when a company emailed me my clerk and even my wife to say that they knew that I'd been shopping for furniture. They knew who I was, the name of my company and everything else. And they'd extrapolated from email addresses to my address, the clerk's address, my wife's address, and had emailed all of us. Now, I don't really see how they believe that was a good strategy. All it served to do was freak me out and lead me to think that they are spying on me somehow. Whereas really what they openly admitted to doing was using software that tracks you when you go to a website so that they can see what other websites you visit and put together a jigsaw puzzle of who you are, what your interests are, where you live, what websites you browse and all of this sort of stuff. But the problem with this is it's not just limited to marketing companies that want to sell you something, which in itself is a bit creepy. But some websites and files and even other people with another laptop on the same network are all designed and trying to gain access to your system. And NordVPN will put a layer of security between you and all of that. It will flag up if you're visiting a dangerous website. It will flag up if you're trying to download a suspicious file. It will help to prevent malicious attacks, such as a man in the middle attack, whereby somebody is pretending to be your bank and you're sending information to the hacker instead of your actual bank. It will also protect your IP address and location by assigning you a new IP address and be part of the virtual private network. I've never experienced it compromising my download speeds and there is also a kill switch, which is really useful because you can kill your internet connection if you are in any doubt that you've connected to a malicious website or that someone is trying to compromise your system. You'll find my unique link in the description below with a massive discount and a 30 day money back guarantee. And they were even kind enough to put me on their website as one of their partners. So check out my link in the description below. Have that peace of mind that if you're connecting to another network or even if you're at home browsing the internet, you can avoid these malicious and dodgy websites that are trying to compromise your system. It's cheaper per month than the average cup of coffee and that for sure is worth the peace of mind. So check out my link in the description and I'm certain you won't regret it. So the key considerations are obviously, is anybody filmed within your footage personally identifiable from their face or from any other information you gather? For example, the vehicle registration mark. Consider things such as the location, where they're going, whether the zoom factors on the camera, what resolution you're filming in, whether you can zoom in and identify the person, how long you film them for, is it fixed, is it moving, is there any creative element to it, is it a static CCTV camera, etc. Those are key questions because that might come back to an exemption because all of this might make it all sound illegal to process this data by these so-called internet auditors. That's not necessarily the case because as you recall from one of the comments, they all seem to rely on the journalism exemption. Now the journalism exemption is something that could be relied on, but it's not quite that straightforward. It never is. So let's look at a situation. Um, this is the current code of practice from the Information Commissioner's Office with regard to journalism and where it might apply. Now, it applies both to 
large organizations and individual citizens carrying out what is referred to as citizen journalism. Frankly, I think that's a polite way of saying anybody that is making a genuine bona fide documentary to an auditor up in a security guard's face trying to provoke a reaction. Forgive me, auditors, but that's what you're doing and we all know it. So it applies to you all. Now, journalism is an exemption that can be relied upon, but only if you can justify it. Because it's not limited to professional journalists and professional media organisations. And so the exemption applies to both, just as the rules do. The rules apply to both types and so do the exemptions. However, you need to be able to justify this section of this code of practice from the ICO. So when you are filming out and about, you have to be filming and acting with a view to publication of the journalistic material. Where you use personal information for journalism, which is obviously if you're filming somebody, whether you're out in, on the street or filming through a window, if the person you're filming is personally identifiable, then UK GDPR applies and you need to decide whether or not you can apply this journalism exemption. Because that is, if you're publishing it on the internet, it is clearly not a household activity. That's been proven in court and that is a no-go. Just because you publish it online, um, even if it is just your own personal party, if you publish it online and the world can see it, it is no longer wholly household activity. Moving back to the exemption. Where you use personal information for journalism with a view to the publication of journalistic material, the exemption can cover all the personal information you that you collect, use or create as part of your journalistic activity, both before and after publication, regardless of whether you actually publish it. However, there's a reasonable belief involved which is that your reasonable belief for the purposes of the journalism exemption concerns whether you reasonably believe there's a public interest in the publication that might apply, for example, if there's a scuffle between police officers and a member of the public and you are filming said interaction. Um, I remember various so-called uh, citizen journalists. And the example that springs to mind because I did a video on it was Charlie Beach. I will now tag him now that he's been mentioned. Um, there was an interaction with police officers. Those police officers are personally identifiable and so are the individuals there. But because there's an interaction and because there is some kind of public interest in how that interaction plays out, that is an example of where a reasonable belief for the purposes of journalism exemption might occur. So if in that example, the citizen journalist reasonably believed that there was a public interest in the publication of the material and complying with part of data protection law is incompatible with the journalistic purpose, then that would probably qualify for the journalism exemption. In looking at the public interest, to judge what is in the public interest, you should consider all the circumstances, balance relevant factors for and against the publication of the material, judge how the public interest is best served proportionately, for example, how long you're filming them for and whether you follow them around afterwards and things like that. This guidance also talks about general public interest factors. For example, the general public interest can take many forms in this context of journalism, there's most obviously the public interest in the freedom to hold opinions and receive and impart information. The right to freedom of expression and information is an essential foundation for democratic society protected by the Human Rights Act. The right to freedom of expression and information concerns the right to exchange information, debate ideas, express opinions. A free press is clearly vital to this. Generally, a free press informs, entertains, increases public debate and participation. It also acts as a public watchdog to hold the powerful to account and uncover wrongdoing. Think police, security, out in public and things of that nature. There are many different journalistic fields, whether local or national, that can perform these roles across a broad spectrum of news, political, business, investigative news to journalism, focusing on lifestyle, art, sports and entertainment, such as show business, news and celebrity coverage. There are also other rights are fundamental to democracy. The courts balance these rights with the right to the freedom of expression and information where relevant. The right to privacy is also protected by the Human Rights Act. A degree of privacy and limits on intrusion is needed to protect people's private and family life, their home and correspondence. That's something I'll come back to in a moment. 
There's also a strong general public interest in data protection that enables people to understand and exercise proportionate control over their personal information. Sometimes personal information may be private, in which case it also involves the right to privacy. Think people inside an office building that may want to keep it private that they work for that company. They might want to keep private how long they're there for, what they are doing there, and things of that nature. Generally, the guidance goes on, there may be a stronger public interest in publishing information if someone is a public figure or has a role in public life or is a professional or business person, etc. That's where you get uh, people being followed around and photographed coming in and out of different buildings and things like that. But again, the building itself will play a role. And again, contrasting with the cyclists, if a motorist is on a public road committing a road traffic offence and it's in the public interest by way of education, public interest and reporting a crime and so on, which is again something I'll have to come back to a bit later, um, then again there is public interest in those situations. And finally, it must be incompatible with journalistic purposes to comply with all the data protection. And in other words, Ordinarily, you would need a legitimate reason to be processing personal data unless you're relying on an exemption. And that's why we're talking about the exemptions. So the ordinary reasons for uh, processing personal data would be on one hand, consent. So for example, you visit a website, it says, can we please process your personal data by way of IP addresses and things like that. Another important factor I'm going to discuss just in a moment, um, Processing might be necessary to perform a contract. Processing might be necessary for compliance with legal obligations. Processing might be necessary to protect vital interests of that individual data subject or another natural person. Processing might be necessary to exercise an official authority or the one that we're all talking about in this video, it might be necessary for the purposes of legitimate interests, including journalism. And so coming back to so-called auditors, I think you'll agree there's a very big difference between a cyclist filming a journey that catches a motorist on the phone causing danger on the roads because that's how many collisions happen, and a so-called auditor filming somebody going about their day job through a window in their own office building. Now in my humble view, it is not reasonable to believe that it is in the public interest to point a camera through a window and film somebody sitting at their desk while they're working. I just don't think that that is in the spirit of journalism. Unless, of course, there is a specific event or specific reason for filming that particular person at that date, time and place. I just don't believe that is in the general spirit of true journalism, citizen or otherwise. So it is my view that anybody accused of breaching the data protection legislation is going to struggle to justify relying on the journalism exemption. If that falls away and they are processing personal data, they may well find themselves in breach of the data protection legislation and a civil claim against them might succeed. But how now about the prospective criminal aspects of all of this? Well, one particular offence that somebody has asked me about in the comment section is that of harassment and potentially stalking. Stalking is harassment that amounts to stalking, but come back to that in a moment. So the Protection from Harassment Act 1997 provides that a person must not pursue a course of conduct, which is conduct on at least two occasions, I'll come back to that in a minute, which amounts to harassment of the other, and which he knows or ought to know amounts to harassment of the other. So anybody that is getting into an argument, a debate, a dispute, which is deliberately designed to provoke a reaction, which arguably in many cases that I've seen it could well be, this might amount to harassment. But then many of you will say, well, first of all, what about the journalism exemption? I'll come back to that in a moment. And secondly, what about it being a course of conduct, which is on at least two occasions? Well, if you think of it as the event and the publication, the publication can amount to harassment as well, because harassment doesn't have to happen in person. So if there's the initial event and then the publication of the event, that is two separate occasions, which is a course of conduct, which might amount to harassment. Now, as to the journalism exemption and contrasting the cyclists' activity, filming motorists breaking the road regulations, there is a defence under this section, which is subsection 3, 
which provides that this offence does not apply to a course of conduct if the person who pursued it shows that it's A, for the purposes of preventing or detecting crime, or B, pursued under any enactment or rule of law, etc., or C, that in the particular circumstances the pursuit of the course of conduct was reasonable. So it would be reasonable if it were genuine journalism. So if it were genuine journalism in the street or firming a police officer because they should be held to account and so on, and it qualifies as journalism, then the conduct would be reasonable and it is very unlikely that they would be charged with harassment. However, the difficulty is, and the concern for these auditors is, if that journalism exemption falls away on one of those occasions and you get a particularly upset or disgruntled employee or set of employees at a certain location that do feel that they've been made to feel alarmed and distressed and so on, and there's both the event and then the subsequent publication, which could amount to a course of conduct, those auditors might find themselves charged with harassment. Because, as I say, if the journalism falls away, the reasonable course of conduct falls away, and they might be left with a criminal charge. So this is the warning for auditors that are striking up videos for the sole purpose of generating a reaction, which then in turn generates views and so on and so forth. But just to round it off, those that commented that GDPR does not apply to individuals, it clearly does for all the reasons that I've said. If it's not clear, um, then do go back and watch it again, but it very much does apply. The data protection legislation does not say this only applies to businesses. It applies where there is processing of personal data, which relates to an identifiable or an identified individual, natural living individual. And so if anyone's doing any of that and there's no exemption that applies, as I say, the most common one that applies is wholly household activity. You take a photograph for yourself, for your family, it doesn't matter, people are incidentally caught in the background, you're using it for yourself. Or even if you're filming it as a citizen journalist and you catch people within the film, if you can justify it's either artistic, it's more likely artistic if you're walking around and you're commenting about what's going on and you're entertaining and all that sort of stuff, that is likely to be artistic and creative and a hint of journalism at the same time. If you are then strictly filming what's going on, then it's strictly journalism and the exemptions apply. But if your activity is purely designed to provoke a reaction, which could cause alarm and distress, and the two occasions, as I've described, could amount to a course of conduct, you might be looking at harassment. So I hope that's useful. Um, please do leave me your thoughts and comments in the box below. Remember, this is none of this is legal advice. It's all guidance, but I hope you found it useful. Please do like the video and subscribe. As always, that helps my numbers grow. And thank you for watching.